Hello everyone, I am Cool Guy, and welcome back to another Planet Destiny video. Today we're going in-depth into the Pulse Rifle for PvP, we're going to be going over the core of the weapon, how stability affects them, how perks affect them, and also some tips when shooting them. The goal is to understand the Pulse just a little bit more, and with that knowledge to become more deadly with them from the beginning player all the way to the more advanced. Now this is how I understand them, ways I have found success with them, and some sections are going to be just a general understanding, while other sections are going to be a little bit more in-depth. Let's first start off with the core of the Pulse Rifle. They have a 1.7 times base zoom. Now that's important. The sight that is used also affects the Pulse. Some sights provide a range multiplier. Some sights themselves offer different buffs to the weapon. They affect recoil. But something like adding the zoom factor lengthens the range, among other things. So I have chosen to go over some of the more popular sights and how they affect the Pulse Rifle. Now these sights are most consistently used by players out there, and some players do use like the quick draw or true sight, and some players use those range sights. But those are kind of left out for time purposes, and they're also left out due to overall player usage. First up, we have some of the older sights. Now these can be found on weapons like the Grasp or Hopscotch. Red Dot OES gives a 0.2 time zoom, making the weapon have a 1.9 time zoom. It gives a plus 2 to range and plus 12 to stability. Red Dot OAS gives a 0.2 zoom, making the weapon have a 1.9 time zoom. Gives a plus 14 to stability and plus 5 to aim assist. We have the Red Dot OREs. It gives a 0.3 time zoom. Now that's important because it makes the weapon have a 2 time zoom, which is the same as a base scout rifle zoom. So the sight also gives a little bit more buffs. Plus 6 to range, plus 9 to stability, plus 4 to reload, and plus 4 to handling. Red Dot ORS gives a 03 time zoom, again making it that base scout rifle zoom of two times. It gives plus 6 to range and plus 9 to stability. It's essentially the same as the ORES, but this one lacks the reload and handling buff. Red Dot ORS1 gives a 04 time zoom, making the weapon have a 2.1 time zoom. It gives plus 8 to range and plus 6 to stability. Moving on to the Suros, very few of these stats are set in stone, because others are unknown. But we're going to go over these to the best of my knowledge and to the best of my ability using the research that I've done. I want to point out that some of the added stats that I give them are assumed, and they're going to have a little star next to them so you know. We have the Suros SL12 and SL19. Both appear to not give a zoom modifier, but give an assumed plus 5 to handling. We have the SPO26 sight. Gives a 0.2 time zoom, making the weapon have a 1.9 time zoom. And again, the assumed plus 5 to handling. The SPO 28 gives a 0.3 time zoom, making the weapon have that 2 times base scout level zoom, and gives it does give a plus 5 to aim assist. We also have the blind perdition, close quarters ballistics, negative 10 to range, plus 15 to stability. Smart drift control, negative 15 to range, and plus 20 to stability. And then smooth ballistics, negative 5 to range, and plus 10 to stability. Those are just a small base to go off of and how I understand them, but the goal is to kind of show you guys how much the sights impact the weapon. And some of these sights can be found on scouts and assault rifles as well, giving the same boost, but those two weapons have different base time zooms. The sights definitely do matter and they affect your weapon, and it goes just past aesthetics. The pulse rifle shoots a burst of three bullets, so let's move on to the four archetypes of pulse rifles and the damage dealt in PvP. First up, we have the fast firing, grasp of Malak, clever dragon, and the waltz. They are of the 77 rate of fire and 4 impact class. They do 23 to the head and 16 to the body. This results in a 0.8 second kill time. Now with 3 bursts you have 9 bullets, so if you land 8 criticals and 1 to the body on a middle level guardian of 200 health, and all criticals have to land if, if you want to get those just high armor guardians like a ram warlock. Now the time to kill to the body is 1.33 seconds, and that's landing all shots at 10 bullets, which is 4.33 total bursts. Now the time to kill falls in between 0.8 seconds and 1.33 seconds. The perfect kill is 3 bursts, but on that 4th burst, the more criticals you land starting off in that 4th burst is where you can fall in between that 0.8 second and 1.33. Next up is the Hawksaw Archetype, weapons like the Blind Perdition. Now, these have a rate of fire of 73 and an impact of 7. They do 25 to the head and 17 to the body, and that results in a .87 kill time if 8 criticals land. That's 200 damage. Now, that ninth bullet, regardless of it being a critical or a body shot, it's going to finish off the highest level of armor guardians. The time to kill to the body is 1.33 seconds as well, and that's with four full bursts to the body totaling 204 damage. And just one critical out of those four bursts, 
burst will down the highest of armor guardians. The time to kill falls in between three and four bursts. Three is the absolute perfect kill. You want four bursts maximum with it. You want to fall in between that 0.87 and 1.33 kill time. You may have noticed that both the Grasp and the Hawksall archetype have a 1.33 second body kill time. This is due to the difference between damage dealt with the Hawksall and the fast fire rate of the Grasp. Differences in damage, fire rate, burst delay equate to that endpoint of 1.33, which on paper is pretty cool and balanced when you think about it. But there's also the effects of things like 30 frames per second, effects of connection that kind of kind of merge these together. Next, we have the Hopscotch archetype, and what I like to call, it's the first sore thumb of the pulse rifles in the current state of the game. Weapons like the Nerwin's Mercy. Then there's also the Hawka type that shoots four bullets within a burst, but we won't be focusing on those today, and they're possibly going to get their own video in the future. They are a rate of fire of 66 and an impact of 14. They do 30 to the head and 20 to the body. So this results in a one second kill time if out of the nine bullets, at least six are critical and one is to the body. That's 200 damage in those three bursts. Now any of the final two bullets really can land anywhere and it will down the highest armor of guardians. It takes a little bit longer and you can just be a little bit more relaxed with this type of pulse rifle. And it's really good in the 6v6 game mode, not so much in Rumble and 3v3 you can kind of get tore up with it. But in reality, you only need to land three of the nine bullets to the head and the rest of the body to down any guardian. That's a total of 210 damage. But to compete, you want to keep this as a three burst kill. They have a 1.5 second kill time to the body, which is 3.33 bursts, and that's 10 bullets. So that 1.5 second kill time is lengthened because of the burst delay. It has the slowest time to kill to the body of, out of all the pulse rifles. And again, the goal of this archetype is to land a three burst kill. No more than that to halfway kind of compete with it. And finally, we have these slow firing pulse rifles. Haka aside, there's only two. So the spare change and Parthian shot. And on the other hand, it's what I like to call the second sore thumb of the pulse rifles in this particular stage of the game. They have a 59 rate of fire and 30 impact. They do 34 to the head and 23 to the body. And you can two burst if all headshots land for 204 damage. And that's a 0.73 kill time. And you might see that and think, wow, like why isn't anybody using it? Because that's better said than done. If it was, you'd be seeing these things all over the place, but that just isn't the case. It is a kill time to the body again of 1.33 seconds with three bursts to the body and that's 207 damage. I've taken my counterbalance, hand laid stock, feeding frenzy spare change out for a couple spins and the cons severely outweigh the pros of this archetype. The issue lies with flinch applied to you, burst delay, and there's just simply no room for error. The others kind of have an ease of use factor that just these don't have. It would be different if they did a tad bit more damage. While the two burst kill can happen, like again, the factors of the damage dealt with the burst delay, things like tracking your targets and flinch, really cripple this class of pulse rifle in the current state of the game. So on the screen, we have the four weapon archetypes, and what it comes down to, like I said, is 100% ease of use. Ease of use meaning how forgiving they are. The first two archetypes, the 77 rate of fire 4 impact grasp and the Hawksaw 73 rate of fire 7 impact are the most forgiving and have really good damage, and you aren't really penalized for using them. Next, let's move on to flinch, and this is the part of the guide where some of the things might come out to be false, and I gotta say that, I'd put that kind of disclaimer, but I do believe I'm on the right track since we definitely don't know how everything is applied. Flinch is how much the weapon kicks when you're taking fire, and every weapon has a base flinch multiplier that they start off with. The pulse rifle, assault rifle, and scout rifle all have a base flinch of one times. Now, the hand cannon's a little bit different. It is the highest base flinch multiplier of 1.75 times. I believe that that 1.75 time multiplier is possibly the highest a primary can go for two reasons. Number one, and again, I could be wrong, number one is that high calipers don't really work on hand cannons, and two, the Mida had a 1.75 times flinch multiplier when it had high caliber rounds. So with all that being said, I've done some testing and still have a little bit more to do, and I've done some things like we're holding a primary, taking flinch, and we have a sniper rifle. But remember, a sniper has severely increased flinch, and up until max flinch, which uh, with that past update, the more bullets that you take fire with, the more flinch that you get. It definitely has different parameters that it goes by, but it could have the very same as every other weapon, but only enhanced. So snipers aren't really the best to use for the testing in my opinion, but I have some testing for you guys to look at in the background. And also there's a point where I believe that there is max flinch. And there's also a point where I believe true answers can be found. Like I put light level enabled on with my buddy. My friend got here to the high 190 light level and he was doing about seven damage per headshot with the blind perdition. So we pretty much got to see what a full clip looks like with, with and without high caliber rounds. So you can see the full, full range of the perk. 
I believe that flinch is not a static number and it appears progressive, at least to me. So on the pulse rifle, we produce a one times flinch. But that base one times can be added to. There are a couple things that increase flinch to your enemy, one being a fast rate of fire. I don't know if you guys remember the Doctrine days, but that was without high caliber rounds. But with weapons like the Grasps, they're gonna apply flinch the quickest in the start of a gunfight. And with that, let's talk about high caliber rounds. With high caliber rounds, they add a percentage, I believe, to the bullet that makes the flinch number ever so slightly larger. So since the number is larger in the beginning at the start, you deal the multiplier up a little bit faster. So when you have a fast firing pulse like the Waltz or the next step up the Blind Perdition with high caliber rounds, I believe that it doesn't necessarily mean that they flinch more than any other gun in the game. I think that it achieves max flinch sooner with the combination of the rate of fire and high caliber rounds. Again, meaning the beginning of the gunfight is where it's going to be the most useful. And I do believe that there is a point of max flinch with that multiplier, and I think that high caliber rounds keeps it there as opposed to not having them. And there's still so much to test with this. I mean, I just did some preliminary testing for this video. I believe that headshots also can kind of increase that flinch multiplier. Things like damage drop off might reduce it. There's a lot to test, so we're gonna get into that one day, hopefully. But we're gonna move on to stability. Stability greatly affects the burst and the performance of a pulse rifle, so there's so many moving parts that we're gonna dig into. This section is also gonna play into perks later on in the breakdown, but all weapons have recoil direction stats. They have sights that also play into recoil direction, and we can't spend too much time on those and how it affects every single weapon, but just know that they play a part. But let's break this down. Each weapon has a base stability, certain traits to the burst with recoil direction. So we're gonna be talking about vertical and horizontal movement, burst trail, and burst drift. The goal is to notice what the pulse is doing, and some perks work way better on one pulse than another. So here's the original Hopscotch. Nothing's changed in year three when comparing it to the original, only this one has hand laid stock to reach maximum stability. So we have that one, but let's take a Hopscotch with no stability perks. This is bare bone, I haven't upgraded it at all. We see that the first burst goes up, and it has a little trail, and that trail is just a little bit off to the side. Now as you keep firing, the weapon trails off just a little bit more and more, it's small. Let's add hand laid stock for maximum stability to see what it does. No. So when adding stability, what it does is it makes the grouping tighter. The vertical, the up and down recoil is brought closer together. But as you guys can see, it still has that small little trail off at the end at the top of the burst. That little trail off isn't bad at all. The hopscotch recoil direction is at 65. So when you up your stability, you make the burst tighter and you lessen the effect of recoil direction movements. If you were to put on counterbalance like right here, what it does is that little trail it had at the top of the burst, counterbalance will eliminate that. So we saw what the hopscotch did. Let's go ahead and move on to this hawksaw. We have an SLO 19 sight, a recoil direction of 50 for the hawksaw, and it has a base stability of 72. So for this representation, for what I'm about to show, fitted stock is added to keep this test accurate and the same. So the stability is brought up to 79. The burst pulls very hard to the left, and that's burst drift. So keep in mind when we're firing fast, if you let the recoil settle in between each shot, it won't do that as bad, but most of the time we don't really pace a pulse shot. But that brings us to counterbalance. We have the same hawk saw, same sight with fitted stock, only this one does have counterbalance. So where raising the stability brings the up and down closer, making it tighter, counterbalance greatly reduces the side to side recoil drift. And a side note, since you are getting good recoil direction with counterbalance, it may appear to add a little bit more of an upwards pop, but counterbalance is stopping the hard pull, bringing the burst closer together horizontally. Then the final stage, here is a hawk saw with maximum stability, it has counterbalance, and it also has high caliber rounds. This is the extremes of pulling the burst to a center point. Both work together, and the higher the stability, the closer it brings everything in. Now all three of these hawk saws set up different ways, all handle completely differently, and it's all noticeable. So here's something to pay attention to. Each weapon has traits. Now we showed the hopscotch with a good recoil direction and the hawk saw with a bad recoil direction. When you take a perk like counterbalance, the base traits come into play. So if you take a hopscotch with maximum stability, it brings that vertical just burst really close together, it really tightens it up, but its tendency is that little trail. Some weapons greatly benefit from counterbalance more than others, like that hawk saw. Each little thing affects them differently. There are a lot of moving parts. And for me, personally, on a weapon like the Hopscotch, I have no need for counterbalance. And we're, we're gonna dive deep into that later with the perks. But a weapon like the Hawksaw, it's a number one perk for me. It also depends on your tolerance of it. If you can control it and you like it and you can play to it, that's fine. Just for me, with, with me knowing what the Hawksaw does, I like counterbalance on them. 
So now that we understand how the stability works and how perks affect it, let's talk about a couple of strategies when shooting the pulse rifle. Now both of these are used as your own judgment, and both have to do with flinch, both have to do with distance a little bit. And I watch a ton of clips on my Xbox DVR that my friends make, and I see some things that are easily corrected. And I see a lot of people like at a distance aiming high. So let's talk about this. The pulse rifle shoots those three bullets and they have that natural upwards pop in the recoil. Just like a fusion rifle, you can control that burst and you can guide the bullets down by pulling a little bit of down tension on your right thumbstick. There are a couple situations where this technique comes into play. Number one is when someone's head glitched on you. If you were to just aim at their head, what happens is you're only going to land like one or two bullets out of that burst, so you can bring that down get as much damage as you possibly can. Because when you're using a pulse rifle and someone's head glitch on you, it's a nightmare. It's something that you don't want to be into, but you can get really good damage on them by doing this. Another time I use this is when I'm getting flinched hard in a gunfight, mostly at mid to long range and mostly against a fast firing grasp or something like a hand cannon. I will see the last bullet get flinched way off the target, so on the next trigger pull, I pull it and bring it and slam it all the way back down, let the bullets land, some in the head, some back to the body, but it recenters me, it gets my shots back on track, and also centers my reticle back on the enemy. And that's going to lead us to our second tip. Don't be afraid to aim low with a pulse rifle, especially at a distance, like right here, I'm aiming about center body mass, but with the rise of the recoil, it lands all headshots, even though the initial shot accuracy is nowhere near the head, it's lined up in the middle of the body. So I do this quite often. And I see a lot of people, like I said, at a, at a distance aiming at the head. So if you're aiming at the head, you're only gonna land one or two bursts because it's gonna trail off of you unless you correct it like we went over a second ago. Or if you're taking fire, you're not even gonna land the burst. So these are just some things to consider. Learning the burst pattern of your pulse and just knowing the pulse inside and out is going to give you a lot of opportunity to make adjustments based on distance, based on things like flinch. And you can do it kind of on the fly. Just knowing where you have to aim to land all the headshots at a distance is, is an example of that. All of those things can make you more deadly with the pulse rifle. We talked about counterbalance a little bit earlier and what it does, so let's go through some of the more popular perks for pulse rifles. Now, we don't have time to go through all of them, but we're going to go ahead and move on to Headseeker. And with Headseeker, what it does, it says... Body shots with this weapon increase precision damage for a short time, so it adds two damage to a critical headshot on pulse rifles. An example would be, let's say, a grasp or a waltz. It does 23 to the head and 16 to the body. If you land one body shot and the rest headshots, it would be 62 damage. If you do that three times, that's 186. But if you have head seeker, that adds two damage to each of those criticals. It now does 25 per headshot, and that's 198 total in that same scenario. So the damage that you can get can save the burst time to kill. And that's just with the Grasp archetype. It all depends on enemy armor, of course. But here are the four archetypes with the Headseeker perk. The Grasp does 25 to the head with Headseeker. So we're going to go through burst totals here. So three criticals is 69 damage. So Headseeker doesn't even play to that. But with Headseeker, one body, two critical is 66 damage. Two body, one critical is 57 damage. Let's move on to the Hawksaw. It does 27 to the head with Headseeker. So three criticals is 75 damage. Headseeker, again, doesn't play into that. But with Headseeker, one body and two criticals is 71 damage, and then two body, one critical is 61. The Hopscotch does 32 to the head with Headseeker, so three criticals is 30 damage. Headseeker doesn't play into that. But with Headseeker, we have one body, two critical is 84 damage. Two body, one critical is 72. The Spare Change does 36 to the head with Headseeker, so three criticals is 102, but Headseeker doesn't play into that. With Headseeker, one body and two criticals is 95 damage, and two body, one critical is 82. With taking all the information that we've gone through so far, things like optimal burst kill times and maximum burst that we want to get the kill, things like recoil direction, drift, stability, along with damage dealt, ease of use, let's build on this. And remember that some of the weapons, counterbalance isn't really that necessary. So depending on your weapon archetype and depending on what your opponent's armor is, Headseeker can save the burst time to kill if you're missing your criticals. So with Headseeker, definitely don't be afraid to aim low. Like with the Hopscotch, we know what it does, and I 100% prefer Headseeker over Counterbalance over any other perk. And it's just, like again, like I said, we know how it works with its recoil direction. So these are just some things to keep in mind. Rangefinder, it's a good perk, but again, it depends on how comfortable you are personally with the base weapon's recoil direction when using it. Then we have Third Eye. It's a decent perk, and Third Eye is never a bad thing, but things like the new artifact can give you that already. It isn't my first choice. Then we have Spray and Play. It's good if you plan on finishing the magazine. If you're a compulsive reloader, spray and play is simply just not going to be for you. It might come in handy in intense situations, but other perks that you can use every single gunfight, like Headseeker, like Counterbalance, like Third Eye, are going to be a little bit more useful on a pulse rifle. Things like Brace Frame that reduce mag to an already small magazine 
are where you're going to find the most use out of spray and play. Glass half full, once you hit half magazine, you get a progressive scaling damage bonus up to 6%. So that equates to one extra damage per bullet and the absolute last bullet will do two damage extra. But again, it isn't useful if you don't get to the bottom half and it's something you can't use all the time in every single gunfight. So even then, the perk gain is not really that good. It's minimal. And here are two weapons that they kind of work with. And now the first one is a complete total perk synergy. We have a villainy, we have counterbalance, Braced frame, it brings the stability up to near 100%, then it reduces the magazine from 30 to 24. Then we have glass half full. It's complete synergy. But also this type of weapon would have been okay with spray and play. This is one of those situations where spray and play could be nice. I know I have a good grouping with counterbalance to land my shots with the villainy, and also this low magazine of 24 will help me get to that 31 headshot damage. It's good because I know I can get a kill, and then I know I have enough magazine for another gunfight using glass half full pretty much the entire time. Then we have this B29 party favor. It's like the Hawksaw. Now we have Feeding Frenzy or Outlaw, then Handlaid Stock and Glass Half Full. So the magazine again is to 24. I could also go Feather Mag for Synergy with Reload with Glass Half Full, Feeding Frenzy, but that's a judgment call for me. It brings down the magazine to 18 and that's just too low. Again, one of those situations where spray and play would have been more beneficial. But I feel that the 24 mag pulse is going to be about the best you can get for glass half full. It gives you that possibility of using it in that first engagement, and the second engagement will definitely have it. It's not too, too beneficial. I mean, you do get an extra three damage per burst, and that final bullet does an extra two damage. So who knows? That could possibly finish somebody off at a distance. It could finish somebody off that's a little bit higher armor than you. Who knows? We have Outlaw and Feeding Frenzy, just like we saw in that party favor a second ago. I choose Feeding Frenzy for pulse rifles because Feeding Frenzy procs on any kill, and whereas Outlaw only procs with headshots. Now the reload is faster with Outlaw, but with pulse rifles, you they aren't really necessarily, you know, precision weapons. They have a good reload in the first place, and Outlaw is just gonna be better suited for a more precision weapon, like a like a hand cannon or a scout rifle. Let's move on to mid-tier perks. The pulse rifle is kind of special, man. There's nothing really too bad on them in the mid-tier. It really depends on all the factors that we've talked about today, and it's one of the main reasons I decided to make this video. You guys know how I feel about range on a pulse rifle, and as an example, here's my hawk saw. We have high caliber rounds, hand laid stock, and then counterbalance, and it's essentially 100% stability. The base range of 27 is reduced to 17 because of hand laid stock, but I have zero issues putting that on with hand laid stock reducing that range. Because as you guys can see, at some of the longer distances, it doesn't really matter. I'm still doing 24, 23. I have the added benefit in that particular situation to have high caliber rounds at max ability, and it's not enough to outweigh the pros of it. Some of the in factors of the range stat, some of the inclusive things like aim assist, which that is in the range stat, is, is affected when you lower the range. I do admit that. But in this particular situation, I know how this pulse rifle works and how pulse rifles work. It's not enough to outweigh the benefit of maximum stability and high caliber rounds. It's just not. So for the top tier, I have hand laid stock, small bore, injection mold, high caliber rounds, perfect balance, and then braced frame. Then again, some of the others, they're all kind of useful, just not as good as the, the, the ones previously mentioned. Single point sling, reinforced barrel, speed reload, snapshot, lightweight, speed reload, things like that. But again, they're all useful, but stability and grouping for me is priority. And again, it really depends on what we've talked about today, guys. The factors of drift, recoil direction, grouping, all that plays a part. So there we have it. I didn't go over everything, but I went over some of the more important factors in my mind. So using this information, I really hope that it can help out some of the new players all the way up to the more advanced. I hope that there was something that you were able to pull from this guide to help elevate your game. I am Cool Guy with Planet Destiny. It's your guide to the Destiny universe. There's a link down in the description below to my channel if you'd like to stop by and say hi, and we will see you out there, Guardians.